I'm Charles, and I'm on a mission to find what's inside everything. To help me get my answers, I have an industrial CT scanner. It takes a whole bunch of x-ray images from all around a subject, and then builds a 3D model revealing every internal detail. Today, we're looking at an air valve, specifically an electrically controlled valve used to extend and retract a pneumatic cylinder. This is all aluminum and plastic, so we should be able to get a really clean image of the insides. I'll tape it to a fixture block and start the scan. This style of valve, known as a directional control valve, is ubiquitous in industrial automation and industry and Hacksmith projects. The weird secret of these electrically controlled valves is that they're not actually electrically operated. There's a tiny little valve inside of them that is electrically controlled, and that controls a much bigger spool valve that does the real work. How do they fit all of that into something that compact? Let's find out. So this is a two-position five-way valve, which means that either you can be directing pressure to the A side and venting the B side, or delivering pressure to the B side and venting the A side. Normally, you have your electrical connections coming in through this gland. So this is a watertight gland, so you can actually pass a cable in through here, tighten this down, and it will prevent the ingress of water into the electrical connections. So you have your wires coming in through here, positive, negative, and protective ground. This happens to be a 24 volt DC solenoid on this valve. What that means is that you want to apply 24 volts between this terminal and this terminal, and that will change the valve position. Our electrical connections actually go right away onto these three spade terminals. These are push connects. And that's because this block actually can come off of here and be replaced easily. So this is detachable, and that leaves this block. This is the actual solenoid of the solenoid valve. And it is a couple hundred turns of copper wire wrapped around a tube. Right here, we have our gland. In here, we have our spade connections, which aren't exactly on the cross section, so they don't show up. And that metal frame is actually what this screw here is going directly into. Pressed insert that goes into that steel jacket that this screw can secure to. Having that steel frame means that you can get a stronger magnetic field down the middle of the solenoid, because you're not trying to pass your return path through air. It actually goes through a nice ferrous steel. On the back side of our solenoid itself, we actually have this threaded cap. And that's what's actually holding the solenoid body onto the valve body. So really, the insides of the valve itself are where the fun is. What's actually moving in here when this fires? This is just a hollow tube. The stationary part is the brass sleeve that we just saw. It has a steel plug pressed into the end of it. And that steel plug actually has a bore drilled down the length of it. And crucially, this cap is actually vented out the sides so that if you had air blowing out this tube, it comes out those vents in the side. This is where the fun begins. The part that's actually moving is the part that's hidden inside of that stem. And that is the moving part of our solenoid. Right here you can see the moving part. It's also hollow because it needs to let gas out. So this is able to move forward and backward under the influence of the spring that is coiled under its head and appears to be packed inside of it as well. So the primary output part of this is a spool valve. It's a valve where all the flow between the ports and of course the ports are the parts that you can attach a pipe to on the outsides. This one's A, this one's B, this one's S, and this one's R. By default, P feeds into A, and B feeds into S. This whole spool shuttles over this way, and your connections would break such that P starts feeding B, and A starts feeding R. Simple, easy, and awesome. Our tiny little solenoid doesn't have enough jam to move this entire piston back and forth. Luckily, this is a pneumatic system, so we have a supply of compressed air going into P. If we can tap some of that and have a smaller valve controlled just by the solenoid over here, well, that can drive this entire spool back and forth using our 150 PSI air supply. How is air getting from here to here? It's tapping pressurized gas from our center gallery with P here, over to this end, which just has an inert end cap on it and a gasket. I suspect this thing's actually symmetric, so we'll find it there. Change the colors a bit, but we're now looking right here, and we can see where this port attaches onto the plastic. There's actually a mating port in the injection molded plastic part. In the section view, the first thing that kind of stands out is butted against the head of our spool valve, we have some other moving part. And we can be pretty sure it's a moving part because there's no way in hell you'd be able to injection mold this geometry into this. And it's got some fins and ribs that would be pressing against the head of the cylinder there. We know that in some way, shape, or form, the motion of this cylinder that's controlled by the solenoid is going to actually be affecting whether we have pressure on the top of this piston or not. It actually needs to be into two states because it either needs to fill it with air and connect it, or it needs to vent it without allowing leaks. It's coming in from our P port, down here, across 
and back over. So it only takes a tenth of a pound of force to hold this orifice closed at the full operating pressure of a valve like this. So that's gonna be able to control whether or not pressure from here is able to reach into here. Now this gallery here has a port heading right onto the head of this whole piston assembly that's pushing against the spool. So if the solenoid is able to fire, it will open up this port pressurize this whole volume and impinge on this piston. Piston head moves this way, spool moves this way, and the valve fires and opens. When we turn on the solenoid, that's how we get the spool valve to move and change the position. But how do we cause there to stop being pressure? We sweep this. We suddenly lose a lot of radius here, and that's because these are deliberate ports run down the length of the moving element of the solenoid. That's so that pressurized air from this gallery up front can actually reach down the length of this. Well, when this solenoid is pulled all the way back, it seals here. What that means is when the solenoid is pulled back, because the solenoid is turned on, you're giving it electricity, it breaks this seal up front, and high pressure gas flows into this gallery. A very short period of time later, this moving element reaches the end of travel and seals off this flow portion. Air can't flow down the length of this. It can only flow around the outside. So you get your gas flow stopped here, but then when you release the solenoid, now, this gets shut again by spring action. Then this, which is sliding this way now, allows gas flow around it on the outside, past this seal, and out the end, into the atmosphere. So this whole element that goes onto the end of the main reel valve is called the pilot valve. This is a really clever design. It wastes a bit of air, a bit of compressed gas, but it means that you can run this massive high flow valve off of a very small control signal. By moving that tiny little stick, half of a millimeter, you can control big proper valve that delivers enough flow to do basically anything you need in a normal automation context. These things are super cool, and I'm really glad you guys have come along with me on this journey to figure out how it is that they work. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave us a like. And if you want to see inside of something, leave a comment with your suggestion. If you want to support the channel, share this video with a friend, or check out hacksmith.store. And if you want to see inside of everything, get subscribed.